Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison from Happiness Is Egg Shaped. And if you're watching, you can see a ridiculous smile from ear to ear because we are back to the original list that I wrote way, way back before we started all this nonsense of my hit list, the people that I must speak to. And I've finally pinned them down to about an hour of his time. I'm not going to waste a huge amount of you listening to me because this guy is gold proper man crush proper fanboy about to happen i'm not often nervous before i speak to people but i am almost shaken because this guy is the guru we are going to learn we're going to laugh uh, we're going to think we're going to be liquid thinkers and if you needed any more of a clue that is the one richard branson loves him geech listens to him he works with Tooney. And now he gets to speak to me. So without any other time wasted, let's bring in the one and the only Professor Damien Hughes. <laughs> what an intro. You should take uh, you out with me, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll be your warm-up guy. I'm just. <laughs> can I just start by saying thank you for giving me this chance to interview as Jake Humphrey's replacement? I really appreciate that. <laughs> oh, no, honestly, thank you for the invitation to come on. I've been looking forward to it for ages. So thanks for making the time. I, I'm just, I'm so excited that I almost don't know where to start, but <laughs> the, I, I like to read. I'm a book guy. I fold the corner over in the yep. hope that at some point I'll go back to it. Every now and then I have, and I look at the page and I think I can't work out why I folded that corner over. Now, the first book I read of yours, almost every page had to have the corner folded over because it was just full of gold. Oh, thank you. How how do you get to a point where you think, right, I've got stuff that other people are going to need to know and I'm going to put it into a book. What what was the tipping point for you to write that first book? The first book, Liquid Thinking. Um, well, I, I wrote it never intending to uh, to put it out to the mass market. So what I was doing was I, I, I was doing a consultancy job at the time where I was helping run uh, some factories just outside of Liverpool. So it was quite a tough sort of working class area that I was working in. And uh, the brief was basically try and turn around performance in these factories because otherwise we're going to close them down. So I spent two years sort of flogging myself, really trying to engage the guys and trying to change the culture to get them to understand high performance. And when I knew that, and we did turn performance around. And one of my favorite sayings, Bruce, is that success leaves clues. So um, I wanted to almost or signpost the clues of our successful turnaround that we'd done. So I had the idea of writing a book where you could almost capture it and just give it to all the guys that were in the factory. So I had no idea how to write a book. So I just set out and thought, well, um, that naivety was a superpower. So I, so I wrote the book. And what I did was I made a list of all the people I liked and admired and thought, how do I get to interview them? So I ended up spending time with Richard Branson, people like for Alex Ferguson. And all these like incredible people were really generous and answered my questions. So I wrote the book and I took it back and I showed it to one of the lads in the factory. And the first thing he did was he went, Richard Branson's mum and dad was rich. That's why he's successful. Alex Ferguson got lucky at Manchester United. So it was almost like I offered them evidence of all these great names and they had an excuse for a get out if they didn't like them. So I then had the idea, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to now interview some of the guys that work in the factory and show how that um, they've adopted the same mindset that Branson did to build a business. But one of the lads, for example, um, he'd, he'd had to leave school at 15. So this is a very quick snapshot of his story. He'd left school at 15, no formal education. He found himself working in a factory, doing a manual labouring job. But he wanted to give his daughters the chance of an education that he'd never had, but he couldn't get them into the best catchment area for the school. So he decided five years out to build to buy a plot of land and build his own house in a catchment area to get his daughters into the best schools, give them the best chance. And he did it. Now, that to me was an example of a guy building his own empire like Branson had done it. But it just started from a different position with a different objective. But the mindset of planning, visualization, things like that were all there. So I started interviewing guys in the factory and telling their stories in between the interviews with Branson and Ferguson and people like that. And then I just published a book myself. So I just went, got it uh, printed and published it. And I gave it out to all the lads in the factory. 
because I was on the verge of leaving I gave them to them and said, right, you've turned this performance around. This is how you've done it. So this is how you keep it going and 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 do it. And then what happened was the um I think it, it was a bit unusual the idea of it. So I started to get a bit of interest of people saying, Oh, we quite like that book. And what I was also doing was I was running a charity in Manchester with my dad, a boxing club. So I, I just produced a few extra copies and flogged the book and then was giving my dad the money to keep the charity going. And it almost snowballed from there. So then I started getting uh, people saying, oh, would you come and talk to us about some of these ideas? So I started doing that and flogging more of the books from the back of the car. And then <laughs> and then eventually, so I was like proper Del Boy style, but then um, and I was writing the second book as a follow-up to it in my own time. Um, when I was like sat in business meetings that were boring, <laughs> this is the night. And then, long story short, a publisher came along and said, We would love this idea, and they bought the book. Um, now that's nearly, I mean, it's scary, but it's nearly 20 years ago now, but that's literally how it started. So, um, yeah, that was the origins of uh, liquid thinking. And when people say to me, like, Well, why liquid thinking? I say, Well, I, I had no, because I didn't know what I was doing and didn't know how to write. But I was sat in a pub one night with my mate, and I was saying to him, "I need to come up with a catchy title for this book that I'm gonna that I'm writing for the lads in the factory." And we were literally having a pint, and he went, "Why don't you just call it Liquid Thinking?" And I went, "If I buy the next round, can I own the rights to that idea?" And he went, "Yeah, of course." So I went and did it, and I wrote on a beer mat, "Do you give me permission to use this title?" And he went, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> so that was literally the origins of it. Now, as I started, and then when I started like going into different environments and people were saying, why do you call it liquid thinking? Like That sounded like really stupid. So I thought I'd better come up with a clever answer. And then I remember reading that Edward de Bono, the creativity guy, used to talk about solid thinking being the root of most people's problems at they couldn't change perspective. So I started saying to people, oh, it's because it, it's the opposite of De Bono solid thinking. But it wasn't. It was literally my mate over a pint. That reminds <laughs> me of every prop forward sort of mantra. No good story ever starts where we were having a salad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. The, the whole thing came from I was having a pint with my mate. That is just... I did yeah, not honestly. know that's where you were going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so I mean, I still feel inordinately proud of that book. I mean, I look back on it now, like I say, nearly 20 years later, and I think, oh, I could have wrote that better, or I could have said that better. But in, at that time, with what I knew and the resources I had, it was the best I could do. And I like, I'm really proud that some of those lads still keep in touch with me now, 20 years later. And was it they ended Dave, up running. Go on, sorry, sorry, was it was it Dave Allred that said? I think he was speaking with about Johnny Wilkinson and how they looked back and they said that they were embarrassed by some of what they did, but then they came to the understanding we were doing the best we could at the time we were at with the knowledge we had, the resources we had. Yeah, and that sounds like that was you. It just here's all my knowledge in this order, in this format for this purpose and like you say now 20 years later you're thinking well actually that could have been better but it's giving you the stepping stone to do all these other things yeah definitely so like there's people in it say for example where you look back and it might quote lance armstrong and use him as an example <laughs> and like 20 years later you go probably shouldn't be using him as a <laughs> as a great example but at that time yeah his story and if you, i'm sure if you if you'd have scratched deep at the time you could have found something to be concerned about but I wasn't doing that. So he's quoted in it. So you look back now and it's almost, it it, 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 the, it captures a time that was really evocative for me as well. But yeah, uh, yeah. But I still get in touch with a lot of the lads that, I, that like featured in the book or that used it. And I feel proud that like they went on to do things like um, run kids football teams or work in the community or they, like a couple of lads even went to and spoke, used the book with their wives, uh, like Weight Watchers clubs and things like that. And what I love about it was that they were taking what what we'd worked to turn around performance in a factory environment, but they were using it to make to, like to try and make a difference in their local communities as well. And that's uh, here's my mum, right? Give them roots and give them wings. 
um, were products of our upbringing. Those are two of our favourite sayings. And that. that's, to me, that is Damien Hughes. Um, your, your roots are really deep. But they spread pretty wide in that community that you're in. And, and lots of people won't know the background of your old man boxing. Yep. You've already mentioned the charity. These are still things that matter a huge amount to you. At what point did did your dad become Damien's old man rather than you becoming his <laughs> <Yeah>. son? <laughs> uh, I don't think, that, well, I mean, it's lovely you, like you're referencing that um, my dad passed away in January of this year. So uh, I died, it's, I'm, I'm still in that place of trying to process the loss of him because he was so, because he cast such a huge shadow over uh, over my life in terms of the influence that he did. And I find myself now sort of, even with my children, I'll, I'll use a phrase or a quote and it, and I go, that's, that's my dad talking. And I know everyone has that where you get to an age where like, you like for some of you listen to music and I go, turn that shit. And, and I go, <laughs> ah, that's my dad talking. But yeah. So, I mean, is like, I think the ripples um, of, of his influence will last for the rest of my life. And I hope I, I can pass on some of the good stuff from him to my children as well. But I mean, he, so his own story for anyone listening to this was, was pretty incredible. So he, 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 he grew up as an illegitimate child in post-war Manchester. Um, and the reason I mentioned that bit is that he was born in a Catholic family. So being an illegitimate child and not knowing your father was a real stigma. Um, but it actually shaped what, what, uh, his old life. So the sport he grew up in was boxing, but boxing is one of those cruel sports that if you've not got somebody in your corner, like a father figure looking out for you, you can very easily get hurt. And that's what happened to him. But then when he sort of got a bit older, he never lost that love of boxing, but he became a father figure to thousands of kids, uh, that maybe didn't have, uh, that kind of influence himself in the community. So, he set up the boxing gym in what's regarded as like, uh, well, it was classed as Europe's third poorest district uh, where we grew up. And I mentioned that to gives you an idea of the kind of social context of a lot of the challenges that a lot of the, a lot of people faced in that area. And my dad had the boxing club there where he, it was almost just a sanctuary away from a lot of the, tr from the challenges and troubles of life. And, and, it's a real mix because there was guys going off to Olympic games and coming back with medals. There was guys going off to fight for world, world titles and they were rubbing alongside guys that were just coming in to escape the drudgery of unemployment or guys coming in there that were getting bullied at school and just wanted to come and have somebody treat them with a bit of respect. So they rubbed along together, which was a really powerful combination. And my dad oversaw it and brought me and my brothers up in that same environment where we were constantly being given life lessons that alongside um, like the school lessons that, uh, that my dad was pushing us. So like really simple things. And I mentioned this before where you weren't allowed to come into that environment and use bad language. And it wasn't a moral judgment of swearing is bad or, or the opposite is good. It was just saying that swearing was a lack of self-discipline that you couldn't hold your tongue that you could only fill the silence with an F word or something. And a lack of discipline was going to cost you if you ever set foot into a boxing ring, for example. So there were certain things like that, that, that were really important timekeeping, the idea of reliability, trust, we need to trust you. And if we I can't trust you, if you're not, if you're never going to be on time. So things like that, it was always coming back to that moral code of being really clear about standards expected of you. And that what, and there was no quarter asked for, but no quarter given from anyone that uh, uh, that went into it. And boxing clubs the world over it can be like that, can't they? The, this, the, if you don't understand them, now I've never set foot in a boxing club in my life, but yeah. I know lots of people who have, and I can see the huge benefits that it gives to them. And it all comes down to that sense of belonging. We tend to flourish somewhere where we have a sense of belonging. And your old man was able to have an impact on kids that, and he'll know some of the stories and you'll know some of the stories, but there'll also be a whole load of those ripples that have gone out into the world and, and you're never going to know. 
Well, that was it. I mean, I'll give you an example, Bruce. Sorry to jump in. That like when we, so like he, uh, we had his funeral at the start of February, and um, the ripple effects. We got like a really like a really simple example, right? There was a there was a guy there, like um, a guy called Lenny Richards, who uh, is he put it this way, he's probably known to the authorities, and <laughs> and that's not, and I'm not being facetious or trying to be smart about him that he'd tell you this himself but him and his brother Sidley uh, came from um, uh, their dad was part of the wind were uh, the Windrush generation that came over to Manchester and this kid was really badly beaten by his father he had like a, a horrible tough environment and my dad had looked after him and uh, this is in like the early 70s and at the end of the funeral uh, he came up and he's wearing this big bright blue suit and uh, he took it upon himself to make sure that Manchester showed respect. So my dad, who was like a stunt driver in front of the funeral cortege, driving alongside and stopping cars on the other side of the road so that people had to show respect for them. Um, you, you know, he, he was leading the funeral, uh, the funeral procession when we got to um, the crematorium. And when we spoke to him afterwards, he, like, he was recounting stuff from the 1970s about my dad treating him with kindness and decency and 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 giving him money to buy a pair of shoes because he had holes in his ones. And this is like 40, 50 years later, this guy was turning up at my dad's passing to acknowledge the debt that he felt he owed to him. And um, I mean, we've heard thousands of these stories since of people reaching out. And it's not because, I mean, this guy I'm describing, he never went on to become a boxer of any renown but he feels that like he told a lovely story to my mum he said when he was sat in a prison cell one day he cast his mind back to who treated him with kindness and the fig and the name that came into his head was my dad and my dad would have done that and never thought twice about it and yet that gave him something to hold on to that when he wanted to try and turn his life around he had sort of a frame of reference to do it for so you write about the ripples that can go on for generations that that, that we almost never know about. Yeah, uh, there's so much in that, and and you make me laugh on social media. Uh, I know you have a go at, at some of the memes that float around. You had a brilliant one recently about nothing brings a bunch of uh, holes together like something that's none of their business and stuff like that. But <laughs> there's the there's the roll dal thing about when you can be anything, be kind, um, yeah. and I. I, I use the ripple effect a lot when I'm speaking to kids and I, and I was delivering a presentation to a parent council and I was talking about the ripple effect and we were talking about growth mindset and I'd never thought of it before and a, a mum came up to me after and says, I think you've missed something with your ripple effect. And I said, okay, go for it. I said, well, if you drop a stone in like you were describing, the ripples go out. What you find is some of them also come back. And I thought, you're absolutely dead mm. on and that's you know although you only you're getting the story back what you're getting is that feeling of my old man did something good for someone that makes me feel good and there's the thing about sport and one of those memes get to the point bruce those memes that say you can teach them how to lay up a basketball or or kick a rugby ball but it's the way you make them feel that's important and your old man had that his absolute core and and that's where you are finding such benefit through the work you do because you're obviously building a strong relationship with the people you're working with well uh, well that's kind of you thank you um but uh, like those lessons have come from from all over so i remember many years ago like the idea of building strong relationships i, I um i remember meeting angelo dundee so I, I so when i was writing that first book liquid thinking he was one of the guys that I reached out to and long story short, I ended up spending an afternoon with him and I was like a kid in a sweet shop because, because my dad and him knew each other. So I went down to meet him and uh, I'm thinking this is a guy that was in Sugar Ray Leonard's corner. He was in every corner from Muhammad Ali and he he was involved with like some incredible fighters. So I turn up and I'm like, and so what was this fighter like? And what was that fighter like? And in that fight, how did that fighter deal with that? And he was really lovely because he indulged me for an hour before we, he'd obviously decided I need to teach him a lesson. And when we sat there, he went, Damon, he said, I think you've got the wrong end of the stick. So what do you mean? He went, I don't work with fighters. 
And I'm sat there thinking, you do? And he went, no, he said, I work with young men that happen to fight for a living. And it was only afterwards I went away and reflected on it. And he'd done it in a really gentle, sweet way, but trying to educate you of, this is a people business first and then a fight business second. Don't get the two things mixed up. And rather than explain that, he sort of taught, taught it to me in a way that still, like, still resonates all these years later. And that's, I think, what I keep in mind. Like, whenever we meet, whenever I'm lucky enough to go into an environment where you're working with people, I always remember that you're working with you know, like young, like young people often that are just happen to be uh, have a capability or an aptitude for a certain sport that they're working in. But that, like, that doesn't excuse behaviours that might be unpleasant or dysfunctional. But equally, it's about trying to understand them and work with them as people, not as not as players. Tom Daly's spoken about that quite recently, hasn't he? That he he was being defined as a diver rather than as Tom Daly, the 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 kid at the time. The issues yeah. with his sexuality, you know, his dad competing in front of the media. You know, he had so many things going on, but people just wanted him to perform as a diver. Why are you not? Why are you not winning? diving competitions because you're a diver that's what you're supposed to do yeah well i'll, I'll give you an example i met um just last week i um i, I was fortunate enough to meet uh stormzy <laughs> right uh, but i was adamant when i got there i thought i'm not calling him stormzy because that's his stage name and that, the context i was meeting him was so when i met him i said I, and he was lovely I, I said to him i said what do i call you and he went just call me mike and i went lovely to meet you mike i'm damien and he like he wanted to engage on a personal level. He didn't want to be this character of Stormzy because he can do that to, to have ten thousand people listening to him elsewhere. But in that meeting room, he wasn't looking to play that role. And it's a bit like the Tom Daly example you offered, Bruce. That it's it you know he's Tom, the young lad from Plymouth, not Tom Daly, the uh, the Olympic superstar that we all know of. And I think. And I think that's why, like, that's why I'm a big one. That I try never to use nicknames when I go into an environment because I always think that infers a friendship or a different type of relationship. Whereas if we're going to work together, let's work on uh, on a level. Do you know what I mean? Or and like, e like even if they're household names, like the Stormzy one, I'm not going to just work on the assumption that I know who you are. So let me tell you, who you are. It's like let's introduce ourselves to each other. So we start the relationship as people first, not as not as uh, like celebrities or as big names or as sports superstars. Yeah, I, I say that to young teachers all the time about nicknames. That's that's a nice one. I get. I I wonder when people call Damien Hughes. In my head, it's a bit like the movie Elf when they can't figure the story. And they call the guy, <laughs> and he's got an hour to be in New York to put this story together. Is do they do they call you when it's hit the bottom? Do they call you when they're just looking for that one percent? When do you get the call? Well, it's a brilliant question. I'd say it often depends if I'm honest, Bruce. So um, frequently, it's often when there's a crisis mode going on. So what you often find, say in sports teams. Um, they talk about the role of culture as a competitive advantage twice, generally, in a season. They talk about it in pre-season because you've got loads of time to fill and <laughs> you can have me and you're already having meetings, so let's put culture on the, the meeting book. agenda. You, you, yeah. you make the book. Here's the here's yeah. the rules and we'll park them until next pre-season. Yeah, and what's our, our ambitions this season? We're going to win the league, right? So you're doing all that anyway. So add culture into it there. And then the second time it often comes around is when you've lost a few games and you're flailing around for an answer. And so he says the culture is toxic, and then that that idea takes hold, and then it's a bit of a uh, repair thing. So that can often be the case. And um, but where and that's fine. Often it's about going in there and just helping them understand that it's not the crisis that they might imagine it to be. But where it becomes really pleasurable is where you get a coach that just understands the competitive difference it can make that calls you in at a time where it's really, it's relatively calm and they wouldn't understand how, how they can utilize it as a coach and use it in, uh, in their, in their toolkit 
of um, of being able to make a difference. And they're so they're two they're two of the examples that often uh, come around. But what I've realized is that, and I've realized this through making lots of mistakes over the years, is that I, where I get the real buzz is working with the coaches, not necessarily with the playing group, because this is just trying to be as self-aware as possible. If you put me in front of a, play, a, a group of players, even if I've got a decent relationship with some of those players in the room, I reckon on a good day, I could get about 70% buy-in to get them to understand the difference it can make. So you could go, oh, that's really good. Or you could also look at it and go, but there's 30% there that are just not having it because of the messenger. Whereas when a head coach stands up in front of that dressing room and delivers the same message, generally they can get about 90 to 95% buy-in because they've got the credibility of already being the head coach. They've got the knowledge what they're talking about. And ultimately they've got the power to select or drop. So I realized after... And this was after a fair old while of making this mistake of going in. I needed to get my own ego out of the way because it, it was an ego thing of wanting to be the one that is sharing these ideas. And once I sort of got over myself and went, get out of the way, work with the coach. So I often describe my, my work takes place in the shadows, which is where I enjoy working most and let the head coaches get, or the co not just the head coaches, the coaches in general, get them in front of it, working with the playing group. And I'm there to support the coaching group uh, as and when they need it. You you obviously pick up so much uh, in your study of people, and you've been in so many different environments through sport, business, education. You've yep. spoken to thousands, and you've spoken to one on one. I mean, you've you've been in, I think, almost every situation. Is there any area you're looking at thinking I'd love a crack at that? In what way do you mean, Bruce? Is, is there an environment? Is there an organization? Would you love to go into a huge thing like Google or would you love to go into the sandwich shop down the road? Is there ah, right, a... okay. Yeah, I, 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 I try not to get caught up in um, in where it is. It, it's more, it goes back to the people element of it, of if I feel that I've got a connection with the leader that invites you in and you've sensed that there's a real genuine intent on their part to 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 work together to make culture a competitive advantage. I it, like the environment really doesn't um, bother me. So for example, I've worked in sportswear. I genuinely don't have a clue about what, or, 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 or my level is the level of just being a fan watching it. That So I don't understand the nuance or the detail of those particular sports, but nobody's asking me to make a contribution in terms of the technical stuff. And that's where I actually think that that plays then to your advantage because you can ask the daft question, mm. why are we doing that? Or how does that work? And you're not doing it to be facetious. They know that you just genuinely don't know, but you're curious to try and find out more. And it can sometimes unlock a deeper reason that you go, well, we've been doing it just because that's what has been happening for the last 10 years here, rather than doing it because it, it has, that it makes a tangible difference. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't try and get caught up in terms of the thought or the nature of the business um, because I think that way it can skew your perspective. Do you find there's a, is there a eureka moment with some of the people that you work with where they, they have this, it washes over them and they suddenly can step back and see the light or... Is it something that you revisit and you come back in in a, a, a six month block to see what impact you've had? Yeah, again, it um, it often varies. So, like with uh, with the when I tend to work, say like if I sign up for a season of working with the team, I I I, I say I'll come in at, uh, once a week or once every two weeks because I think. If you part the furniture, people stop listening to you anyway. But from my point of view, if you're there every day, you develop this concept called a scrotoma, where you become blind to what they're doing every day. So I think if you can come in intermittently, you see things that maybe other people have just started to accept as the norm around there. So I'll give you a really simple example. I remember years ago going in with um, a head coach who took over 
the role of a uh, of a team. And I was sat at the back of the room, and what struck me was after the team meeting, the players sort of just left cups and water bottles lying around, and then what was happening was the junior coaching staff were going tidying it up for the next meeting. And when I was like, what, like, what's going on here? And and today, this is almost commonplace that the, the sweep the sheds mantra has, has sort of um, crept into lots of things where people wouldn't accept that now. But I'm talking uh, like 15 years ago before anyone knew that idea. So I was able to pick up on that and say, Make the players do it themselves. That lack of accountability or waiting for somebody else to uh, to to sweep up their mess isn't culturally acceptable, and you need to make that understood. So, but they'd been doing it for about six weeks before I started working with the head coach, and it was almost like they had that many things going on in their head. They'd missed something that when somebody like me points it out, they go, "Oh yeah, it's obvious. Why would we do that?" but they hadn't spotted it. So often it just stops. My role can often come in just to pick up on things that other people start to take for granted. Right, here's one for you. Oh. FA Cup final, yeah. Liverpool turn up wearing white suits. Yeah. What does what, what David Hughes make of that situation? Would that Was that a good idea? Was that, it didn't matter, it's insignificant? Um, it depends on whose side I would I'd be working on. So if if you were working on the opposition, you'd probably well at that stage you like you're not looking to add a great deal in. So when you get to cup final stage, a lot of it is taking the emotion out of it and getting them focused on the process. So I'm not sure you'd be flagging it up um, in the moment, other than just to say, look at these guys here. These are already swanning around thinking that they'd won it, but. So, or there's an there's an air of complacency or cockiness. You might say that, but the reality is, like when I've been lucky enough to work at uh, cup finals, you're often trying to get the guys to take the emotion out of it rather than add to it because you just want them nice and calm. So, really simple example that we did do before uh, one, um, uh, well, it was a challenge cup final in rugby league where I was working with the coach. And the team I was working with, they'd not been to a cup final uh, in any of their players' lifetimes. So what we did the day before was we just got the players to practice walking out of the tunnel. So we got them lining up in the dressing room, just walking out of the tunnel and at every stage getting them to imagine, how are you feeling now? Just go through the experience of you stood here so that none of this spooks you tomorrow when it's a full house. Trying to imagine it's a full house, the opposition are lining up and... Then we got them out on the field, line up in your positions for kickoff, line up when we've scored a try, where do you go back on the field, swap them round, then gave them a chance to go and sit in the stands, imagine who's watching you. And, I mean, it's impossible to uh, to quantify whether that made a difference or not, but I don't think it did any harm because most mm. of the players bought into it. So the, so the day after, when we played Leeds in the final, what was really interesting was when the players came in the tunnel, the Leeds lads were trying to catch our players' eye. But our players, because they'd already rehearsed how they were going to stand, just didn't buy into any of it. So there was a there was almost like a laser light focus from the off. Now, but but the nature of my work is it's difficult to quantify. So I'm telling you that example there, and it's like, oh yeah, we did this and we did that. But if it had gone wrong, I'd still advocate that we'd have done it anyway. <laughs> so so you can only sort of try and apply best practice and not get caught up in whether um, you win or lose because there's so many different factors there that come into play. I remember, I think Rob Baxter spoke about Exeter Chiefs. They got to their first Premiership final at Twickenham, hadn't been the best team all season, and they lost. And they were all taking selfies and they were amazed at where they were. And and then the next year, it was like you said, emotion had been taken out of it and they go and they win it. But they needed that almost rehearsal yeah. the year before to get and hindsight's the great gift isn't it it's like you're saying you know that probably wasn't the only thing that led to them winning the second time but the feeling of being there before do you find working with experienced or young and innocent has any difference does that give you a different oh, approach cool. to how how you go towards your work it's a brilliant question i'd say not really. I, 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 like, I'm sure you're like me, Bruce. I'm sure you know lots of really smart young people, and equally, you know lots of stupid old people. That I don't think it's. I don't think age infers wisdom. I think 
uh, experience plus reflection is where the wisdom comes from. So I just think because we hit a certain age, uh, oh, yeah, we have to listen to you. Well, not if you're repeating what you did 20 years ago and because you've never thought any more about it. I so, say that about teachers all the time. Old teachers get a bad rap. I know lots of great old teachers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because because is So I think when it comes to working with somebody, it's how open are they? And how willing are they to reflect on it and apply it? So I've not necessarily seen any correlation between age or uh, th that's either good or bad. It tends to be more about uh, open-mindedness, uh, willingness to engage, and that, more importantly, that, that, that capacity to go and reflect on what you've done and think about, could I have done it better? So that tends to be far more important than, uh, than any other factor I've found. Stories are a huge part of what happens. Um, we all love a storyteller. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, I'm guessing your old man was a storyteller and was able to hold court. My my old man around the dinner table, you know, we used to sit as a family to have to, and my dad would regale you with stories and things that had gone on. And I loved that. And I love to tell stories and I would love to think that I can I can do that. Stories are really important in learning. Are, do you where, where do you find your stories from obviously from experience but you don't want to go into an environment and say here's what I did at this last one here's the story yeah, yeah. here's and and go for it so how do you tailor your story to fit the situation yeah okay that's a, again it's a really smart question i think i i th I, I think every coach i've ever met has been a really good storyteller and like like i'm sure again it sounds like with your dad and the coaches you've been around, Bruce, like you sit in the company and they're regaling you and they're holding court and you're laughing and you're, and you're there in the moment of the story. But it's only when you come away from it and you go, what? Ah, and you can remember the detail and you remember what was the point that they were teaching you is where you go, that's coaching. That's brilliant coaching. And what I found is that every coach tends to have almost like a, a war chest of stories that they draw into. So I did a book for example, on um, like studying the methods of Alex Ferguson, where I went and interviewed a whole raft of players and staff that had worked with him. And after a while of leaving them, you go, I reckon he had about 20 stories that he used to draw on at certain times of the year because they'd all recount. The, but again, it was like they could all recount pretty much the same detail of the story. And it often tended to, they could all understand the point of it. And therefore they could almost date it in a year when he'd done it. So the, the, so every coach tends to have these stories to emphasize a certain point that they want. But you're right, then it's about spotting the moment for it and whether uh, it, uh, it tends to be appropriate. So what I try and do is I just try and stay open to stories. Like I love, I love picking up stories like a magpie off coaches and going, oh, I love that one. And how did you use that? And then try and attribute it to them that like when you recount it, because again, I think it carries credibility that if you go into say working in rugby union. So when I worked with Gregor and the SRU there, I take, I remember once taking a story with them from, a, from the world of boxing and sharing that with one of the coaches and not because of any other reason that I just think, cause it wasn't their world and they didn't necessarily know the characters I was describing. They can't then go, yeah, but he was a dick or he like, uh, <laughs> or so so it's harder to discount the personalities when you're recounting the story, when you say, but the purpose why they did this was because of this. So I'll give you an example. Like when, um, um, when I went and met uh, Angelo Dundee, um, I, I, I told you the example there about the people and person. Another great coach I went to meet was Emmanuel Stewart at the Cronk Boxing Gym. And the story I always tell about him was I was nervous when I got there and he went, how are you? And I went, oh, I'm really good, thanks, uh, Manny. How are you? And he was like, oh, I'm good. And he went, how are you really? And I ended up sort of just blurting out how nervous I felt. And when I got to know him a bit better, I said to him, why did you ask me that second question? And he went, that was when we started working together. The second question opens up the relationship. And so, I mean, there's a lot more detail than I'm sharing with you there, but that was the nature of it. So what you, I was using that in a different context with the coaches to say, always ask the second question. Don't take the first answer as read. Always use this, always ask the second question. 
because, and, and, and again, to sort of cross pollination, I remember when I was working in rugby league and this was when uh, one of the players came to us and he said, will you not take my first answer as red? So in rugby league where you can do the turnover of uh, players regularly, when the physios had run on the field, they'd always say to him, how are you feeling? And if he'd just come off like a, a hard couple of minutes, his first answer was, I'm knackered, I need to get out of here, I'm struggling. And he said, but if you give me half a sec- half a minute and you come back later on, my second answer will often be, I've got another 10 minutes in the tank here. So the second question is cross-pollinated. So I got it from a boxing gym, seeing it applied in a rugby league setting, and then I was passing it on to the coaches uh, at Scotland. So it's almost about knowing, like having those stories in your in your supply, but then recognising the opportunity to share them where, where people go, ah, I can do something with that, rather than that's made me laugh. It becomes something really tangible that they can apply. And and that's coaching, and that is coaching. And I love, right, here, here's one, here's another one for you. Right, you work, you work Alec Ferguson, you go into a huge amount of depth, you're looking at the impact he has. Yeah. You know, that was a, an unbelievable period of time. And he was, what, one game away from losing his job, two games away from losing his job. And just recently, you've spoken to Davy Moyes. Yeah. I mean, Davy Moyes was, he was to be the successor. He was going to take over from, you know, Alec Ferguson had given his royal stamp of approval, go for it. And then it doesn't quite happen. Do you look at situations like that and think, I could have helped? Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose it, it sounds arrogant to say I think I could have helped because I, I was an outsider to it. But like when I spoke to uh, David Moyes, I like what I like as an outsider looking in, I've seen at Manchester United what I've described as cultural vandalism taking place in the in the ten years since Ferguson stepped down. That you've just seen them dismantling standards that he'd put in place and and what he would have imagined would have been there to, like built to last. They needed refreshing, but they didn't need dismantling. And I think, so that was one of the questions that I asked David Moyes. I said, why did you get rid of all the backroom staff? You've Because not because I, I know whether the backroom staff were any good, but you're letting 30 years of corporate memory walk out of the building with Alex Ferguson. And there's nobody there to explain the rationale of this is why we did this or anyone to, to keep along. And to be fair to David Moyes, he didn't shy away from the question, but his answer was, he said, I went and spoke to two very experienced, very successful football coaches, and he wouldn't say the names of them. And he said, and I asked them, what should I do? And one of them said, keep the backroom staff and just bring one of your own appointments. And the other coach said, clear everyone out and start again. So he said, so what we said later, hindsight is always twenty twenty. So you look back on it and go, what a silly decision that was, but his point was when he was going and gathering information from people that had been there and done it, he was getting conflicting answers from it. So he was humble enough to say, I made the wrong call in hindsight. But at the time he said, I genuinely uh, was canvassing advice. I didn't discount that as an idea, but I decided in my end that loyalty was one of my core behaviors. And I needed to be loyal to the staff that had got me this opportunity and nobody was persuading me not to clear out the back room. So it's very difficult. And I'd, and so, again, there's a danger here that not wanting to come across like a smart ass or somebody that is, that like, I've had that quote from, I, can't, I think it was Ernest Hemingway that I said, a critic is somebody that watches a battle from a high place and comes mm. down and shoots the survivors. And I think it's easy to sort of come yeah. down and go, oh, David Moyes got it wrong and this is why he got it wrong. But he, he, he's honest enough to share the rationale that he did behind it as well. So it's difficult to know whether I could have made a difference. I'd love to have sort of had more information on it rather than picking it up now. But yeah, I, I, I often find it fascinating to see the challenges that, that these guys are often taking on, like, like Moyes did. Yeah, and like we say, he was he thought he was doing the best at the time he was in with the resources he had and the knowledge that he had, he was just doing the best job and it's like time... me writing that book that I'm looking back twenty years later and saying to you, there's bits in there that yeah. like I, I probably would have do differently now and I'm sure 
But but then that also ties into the other answer because we're willing to reflect, we're self-aware, mm. and then we reflect and go, could I have done that better? And the answer is inevitably is yes. And that's again the hallmark of all great coaches. And I'd include David Moyes in that. Well, there's there's a couple of bits in this interview so far, Damien. I'm going to clip and have as my message uh, alert and my ringtone where you said you're like me, Bruce. I'm definitely keeping that one. And you told me <laughs> I get asked a great question, so I'm keeping that one. But I, I I I feel there, there's a movie when when I was a kid, and I'm going to ask you if you watched it, and then I'm going to ask if you think you know what bit I'm getting at. The, the movie, The Mighty Ducks was an amazing movie and there's a character in it that i think was like me and he said something and even though i was young when i watched it he said something and i thought that's me that is do you know go what on, i'm talking what about it? no go on it's i think it's in mighty ducks 2 where he gives the shirt to somebody else to play and he says to the emilio estevez character i always knew i was going to be a better coach than i was a player now really? i I think I always knew I was going to be a better coach than a player. It doesn't help that I'm slower than a fortnight in the jail. Um, <laughs> um, right, there's the, but I talked the game. I understood the game. I loved listening to coaches. When, Like you're saying about picking up stories. I was a magpie. I still say things now that Rob Moffat and Bill Noble said to me as a 14-year-old and 15-year-old kid really? um, because it had such a lasting impact. I knew I was going to be a better... Now, I've not coached the international level i've never been a professional coach but i'm a better coach than i was a player yeah what, did did you have that moment yes definitely um so i so i did two sports boxing and uh, football um and um the boxing i uh, my dad always used to say to us that, that you play football but you only box so it's almost that idea that you don't mess about with it and what he was very good at was that um Boxing is a sport like what he'd experienced where people will chew you up and spit you out. And he was adamant that if you didn't have a decent level of aptitude, you shouldn't do it. He always, like, he'd have guys that were very willing and game and they'd come and say to him, have you got any other interests or is there anything else? Have you got, are you pursuing an education? And if they said, yeah, he'd say, go do that. Don't, like, this isn't a sport to play at than if you've got something else to do. I think so, Barry McGuigan, I heard Barry McGuigan interviewed again when I was a kid and somebody right. said to him, why the hell are you a boxer? Yeah. And I think his reply was because I can't be a poet. Yes, right. So it's that sort of thing that if you can do something else, go and do it because it's a pretty cruel sport to earn a living in. So my dad was adamant that, that me and my brothers uh, could box and, he, and so he let us do it up to a certain level and then after that, he was adamant that we had to go and pursue an education, that that we didn't go too far into it. Um, and there was a whole heap of different lessons that uh, that he taught us. The one that I recount was that when I was uh, about 13, 14, and I'll tell you a funny story. I put this in. Uh, I'd, I had a book come out before Christmas, and uh, the publishers were like, I told one story about the boxing club and they went, Oh, take that out. That's really violent. And that's, that promotes violence. And, 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 and it didn't, there's a coaching story. I'll, I'll, so I'll tell you the story in a minute because you'll appreciate the coaching part, but they were like, Oh, we don't agree with that. Take that out. So they said, put another story in. So I wrote this story about me getting a good ID at 13 in the boxing ring. And they loved that. They went, keep that in. And I went, well, that promotes violence. But I think they love the idea of me getting my comeuppance. <laughs> so, so they put it in in the opening chapter, put you in getting a good... Uh, but the story about it was that I told the story of... I was trying to tell about the moral compass that great coaches can inculcate. And my story was I took a liberty with the lad sparring when I was 13. So I was overmatched. He was a novice. And in the first couple of seconds, you realise, oh, I'm better than him. I'm stronger, faster. I know what I'm doing. So the code in my dad's gym was that if that was the case, you slow down and you go to the level of the novice and you work, you coach them in how they can get better and you show them how to slip a bunch or whatever. So you're both learning. But I was 13. I was an idiot, immature. And uh, I didn't adopt that. So I took a liberty with the lad and threw some shots at him, hit him, knocked him about the ring and basically acted like a bully. And as I was climbing out of the ring after we'd done our sparring session, my dad stopped me. He said, where are you going? I said, I've done my sparring. He said, that. So you've not done a workout. He said, that was easy. Stay in. And he put a young professional boxer in the ring with me. 
And for the next three rounds, this guy didn't physically hurt me, but emotionally and mentally just took me to pieces that he just, he just banged me head back every time he threw a jab, slipped every punch I threw back at him, moved me around, spun me, and just basically exposed me for what I'd done. And as I got out, I remember everyone in the gym had sort of stopped. And I, to my mind, they were sniggering at me getting served humble pie. And as I got out of the ring, my dad said, how do you feel? And I couldn't speak. I was that ashamed. But I, I thought I was going to cry if I, if, I, if I said anything. And he just quietly said to me, how you feel now is exactly what you did to that boy just before it. And he said, don't ever let me see you bully anybody ever again. Now, it's a lesson that it's brilliant coaching because I still live that mantra to this day. But that was a story that the publishers went, oh, keep that in. We love that bit of you getting a good idea. <laughs> but um, but the story, I'll tell you this great story that I put in that they made me edit out was that when we were in Madison Square, again, and so I've zoomed forward 30 years later and me and my dad find myself working in the corner at Madison Square Garden, right? We had a lad fighting for a world title and he's boxing a Hall of Famer called Miguel Cotto. I'm in the sort of bowels and I'm there thinking, this is Ali Frazier territory. This is where all, all the greats have been. So we've got over the sort of uh, how incredible it is, but we're there on the night of the fight and you sat in the dressing room and it's like being in the gallows, like you're waiting for the, uh, the, the bell to signal that you've got to go, so the nerves are building up. So my dad's bandaging this boxer's uh, hands, and uh, the opposition, this Miguel Cotto's camp, send, a, send one of their camp in to observe the bandaging of the hands. So after he's done it first time, bandaging him, it's about 15 minutes to do it properly. This Puerto Rican guy goes, do it again, I'm not happy, that's not right. So the New York official says to my dad, will you do it again? Just re-bandage his hands. So he goes, okay, fine. So they do it again. Gets to the second time. We're getting closer to the fight now. And he waits till he gets to the end of the second bandaging of the hands and he kicks off again. He goes, oh, I'm not happy about this. This is not right. Do it again. Do it again. And he's shouting and making a fuss. So the New York official says to my dad, do you mind doing it again? Just do it one more time. Do it again. So he does it again. And when we get to the third time, literally now, we're getting close to the fight, so you need time to warm up. And this guy, it's all mind games. He's all trying to distract and stop him warming up properly. He kicks off and blows off again about, I'm not happy about this, not doing this. And uh, my dad says to me, and I knew what was happening from about a minute before it happened, but my dad said to the New York official, he lets this guy sort of be like sound and fury, and he says to the New York official, am I listening to you or am I listening to this big mouth here? And uh, the New York official goes, no, no, you're listening to me. And then this Puerto Rican guy goes, no, you're not. You're listening to me. And I saw my dad just subtly move his chair back and stand up and just deadbutt this fella, <laughs> right? Send him sprawling. And everyone jumps in to intervene. <laughs> and in the fuss, this, guy, this Puerto Rican guy gets led out of the dressing room. And in the sort of quiet after the storm, my dad turns to all of us, but especially the lad he was fighting with, and says, listen, whatever happens tonight, nobody's going to bully us. And the atmosphere in that room was just like, whoa, like it was just, it was a brilliant coaching point of a coach because it's like that old saying, fights aren't won in the tunnel, but they can be lost. And this guy was trying to make us lose the fight by distracting us, eating into our warm up time, making us all feel nervous and on the back foot. And he just found a way of shifting the momentum to say, nobody's bullying us tonight. And he was giving away 30 years to this guy when he did it. But it was only afterwards when we were traveling back and I said to my dad, I said, why did you do that? Because he wasn't a violent man. And I said, why did you feel the need to do that? I saw you going to do it. Why did you do it? And he said, he said, I wasn't bothered. He said, I didn't feel any anger towards him. He said, but on the second time when I was bandaging his hands, the box he was working with, he said, I noticed his hands had started to shake. So I knew that he'd started, this guy had got to him and the nerves were starting to kick in. The adrenaline was making him shake and he was wasting energy. So he said, while I was doing it, I was trying to think, how do I shift the momentum here and get back in the ascendancy? And that was the way he did it. So I told that story thinking that to me, and I explained, this is brilliant coaching. And that was where they went, take that out because that promotes violence, but put in the story about you getting a, <laughs> a good acting <laughs> instead. Which, <laughs> But the reason I tell you, I've got off on a, on a, um, tangent there. The reason I tell you that is because that was when I realised that I wasn't going to be um, a boxer. 
that was when I realised that I was a good trier. But that moment of getting um, my uh, my backside handed to me was the moment that I thought um, I wouldn't go down the coaching route. So when I was about 15 was when I started doing my coaching badges in football and in boxing because I just had that real... Because I was seeing like the work in the shadows. I was seeing the analysis, the the preparation, the, the game plans, the man management. I was seeing all of that and that was... I, I, I was lucky, excuse the pun, but I was getting a ringside seat to it and I was thinking that's where I want to go. And that was where my affinity then of working with coaches has always um, really uh, originated from. Now, I, I've got to let you go because you're a busy man. You've got places to be. So very quickly, what was it like? I can I collected Panini stickers. I've got 87, 88, 89. I've got the 90 World Cup. <laughs> I loved Panini stickers, and I always what? wanted to go to the Bobby Charlton Coaching School, and I never won the chance to go. Bobby, yeah. What was it like working at the Bobby Charlton Coach uh, Soccer School? Well, that was where, I mean, it was a billion. I bet you, like, you'll get a lot of uh, coaches in Manchester that started there. So I, so that was where I got that first, uh, that, like my first coaching job. I think I was 17, uh, was working there. And it was brilliant because you, again, you get an exposure to like he, so Bobby, and he's poorly these days, but he'd come along. And if you sort of were respectful to him, he'd give you some amazing stories and anecdotes and then you'd get it's like i'm like i remember once right seeing him in his shit he turned up in his suit so he had his suit on and his, his like his suit shoes and uh pinging the ball off the crossbar from the halfway line and i'm not talking about doing it once ten, like nine out of ten times just standing there pinging it showing you technique 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 just the consistency of being able to do it so even at a young age, you're like, how can, like, because it was a sponge, you're like, how can you not soak up being around guys that are sharing wisdom of, like, Matt Busby, Alf Ramsey, Jimmy Murphy, all the coaches that he'd experienced? And he's, if you asked him the right questions, he's telling you this is what, like, I remember saying to him, what did Alf Ramsey say when he came on the field at, like, after full time? And he's telling you, know, this is first-hand history. You've got the greatest English football of his generation saying, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Alf Ramsey was a great coach, that he just understood me, he understood how... Like, he told that great story, and I've heard Alan Ball tell it. And I just think, this is brilliant coaching, where he said to Alan Ball once, he said, have you got a dog, Alan? He said, yeah. And he says, and what, he said, do you take it for a walk? Yeah. And what do you do with the dog? He says, I take it to the park. And what do you do when you go to the park? He said, I throw a ball to it. He says, and what does a dog do? He says, it brings the ball back to me. He said, right, well, I want you to imagine that you are the dog and I am Bobby Charlton. So when I throw the ball, your job is to get it and bring it back to Bobby Charlton. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby Charlton tells that story. I've heard Alan Ball tell it, but you're like, what a brilliant coaching example that he's just used a metaphor from Alan Ball's own life and simplified the nature of his job. Your job is listen to get that ball and bring it back to the guy that can play football. That's all you need to do. And if you focus on that, like all the great coaches, like Brian Clough, I've heard Roy Keane tell this, Brian Clough saying when Roy Keane made his debut against Liverpool, can you pass the ball? Yeah. Can you run? Yeah. Just do those two things out there. And that's it. <laughs> Let's not overcomplicate it. I love, and he, did he not say to Jack Charlton, Jack Charlton said, I'm not the best player. And he said, don't pick the best players, I pick the right players. That's right. Yeah, that's what he's... Yeah. Yeah, that's what... The, the, yeah, Ramsey said that to him. That isn't that just in coaching in a nutshell? It's not about the best players. It's the right players. That That's what like your passion is. That's what mine is of understanding great coaches. But that these guys are summing it up. And if you're willing to open your mind, they'll share it with you as well. They're not, they're not ungenerous people that are trying to keep all this knowledge to themselves. They're trying to share it. And that's really what I love sort of trying to pick up and share as well. Well, that that's you. You're one of the great coaches and you've you've shared it. You've opened it up to me and I really, really appreciate your time. But I know you've got other places to be. Damien, the, the only bit of this that's ever scripted, can you just finish the sentence for cool. me? For you, happiness is? Taking Teddy, my dog, for a walk. Nice. 
nice. Right. I, next time you're up in Edinburgh, bring Teddy and I'll take Maggie and we'll go for a walk and we'll Brilliant. chat all things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damien, you're tired listening all the way, Teddy. So uh, uh, Mag, it's been Maggie, a pleasure. Thanks. She's usually under here making a nuisance of herself. She sometimes <laughs> appears just here for those people that watch us. <laughs> Damien Hughes, professor, uh, author, speaker, guru, thank you so, so much. I have absolutely loved speaking to you. It's been a real honour. Oh, the the pleasure and the honour has been mine, Bruce. So thank you for having me. And anyone that's got this far in and listening, thank you for listening as well. <laughs> thank you, sir. See you soon. Look forward to it. Cheers, Bruce. I have loved every second of that and I've got lots of ringtones and notifications and all those little bits. What an absolute gentleman and a great coach. So many things I've noted down. I'm going to have to listen back to it because there's learning in there for me to reflect on and become better. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, you can catch us on Acast and Spotify. You can watch on YouTube and Facebook. Go back. There's a whole back catalogue there. Lots of people to listen to and to watch. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please leave us a review. Tell your friends. And if you've got a nice comment, by all means, add that too. And if nothing else, hopefully you've learned something today from Professor Damien Hughes. Go and buy his books. I'm not on commission. I just think they are well worth the read. I look forward to speaking to you all again very, very soon. I'm away to find something that wipes this smile off my face. My name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast, and my happiness is egg-shaped. I look forward to speaking to you all again very, very soon.